Welcome to Get Sleepy, the podcast where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Thomas. I hope you're all doing well out there, and it means a lot to have your company tonight. I'm sure you've heard of the Taj Mahal, the majestic ivory-white marble mausoleum in India. You may have seen it in travel photos, or maybe you've even been to the legendary place yourself. But no one living today saw the Taj Mahal as it was being built. Tonight, however, we'll use the power of our imaginations to see just that. So, let's take a moment now to transition from the busyness of the day into the slow and peaceful ambience of night. For a lot of people, myself included, this moment of getting into bed can often be the time when our minds start to overthink and catastrophize which of course disrupts us from our rest. Without the chores of the day to keep us occupied, it's easy to feel confronted with numerous worries and thoughts when our head hits the pillow. That's why it can be good practice to keep a diary, so you can offload those thoughts on paper before bed each night. And that just allows them to exist outside of your own head, making more room for peace and quiet. At this moment right now though, all I want you to do is breathe nice and slowly, really filling up your lungs with the inhale, and then gently letting the breath go as you exhale. And at the same time, repeat the words, I am calm in your mind. Breathe in and say to yourself, I am. Then as you exhale, say, Calm. I am calm. The more you affirm this phrase, the greater sense of calm you'll feel throughout your body and mind. And as you gradually sense that easing of worry and disruption, you can simply continue along the path to sleep by listening to the sound of my voice. We're about to go on a historical adventure, so let's head back in time to a world that was very different from the one we know today. It's a cool, quiet morning in the Indian city of Agra. The year is 1640. Construction of the Taj Mahal, which means crown of the palace, has just about wrapped up. The Mughal emperor, Shah Jahan, had the Taj Mahal built as a loving tribute to his wife, Mumtaz. She was laid to rest here a few years ago. The Taj Mahal was originally built as a mausoleum for the emperor and his wife. 
but over the years, it will become famous throughout the world as one of the most stunning symbols of love ever made. Due to its unparalleled beauty and the care that inspired its construction. You stand at its gates now, relishing the crisp morning air. Built on the southern bank of the river Yamuna, it's a beautiful, dazzling white building. Although you can't see the river from where you're standing, you can hear the sound of rushing water in the distance. Every once in a while, it's accompanied by gentle birdsong, creating a beautiful morning melody. It makes you feel grateful for your presence here, this early in the day. Somewhere in the distance, a man sings an early morning prayer. The notes of his voice are carried softly on the wind, blending with the harmonies of the birdsong and the river. You close your eyes and try to focus on his voice, which is both soothing and deeply moving. The city around the Taj Mahal is just starting to wake up. Farmers are heading to their fields, and shepherds are herding their animals. Roosters cry out from various corners of the city, their calls echoing through the air. Every single sound is clear and distinct. One day in the future, the skyline will be filled with buildings. But in this moment, you can only see the Taj Mahal and a few other colorful domes in the distance. There is plenty of space between them, so you can see the sky clearly. It's streaked with shades of yellow and orange from the rising sun complementing the reds and blues of the domes. Agra used to be the capital of Shah Jahan's empire, and it shows in the quality and number of important buildings here. Although the capital was moved to Delhi in 1638, the splendor of this city has not dimmed in the least. Agra benefited from the emperor's love of art and architecture. The Taj Mahal may be the crowning glory of his patronage, but there are also many attractive red brick buildings that dot the landscape. Shah Jahan was the fourth emperor of the Mughal dynasty. Primarily based in the Indus Basin, this impressive empire covered most of India, Afghanistan, and current-day Pakistan. The Mughals were known for their support of the arts. They introduced many aspects of Persian life to different parts of South Asia, creating a rich cultural tapestry that will leave its imprint long into the future. In this part of India, the Mughal influence shows in the architecture. For example, minarets, the tall, thin towers that are attached to mosques, are very common. The Mughal style of architecture often features elaborate carvings. Many of these buildings, like the one before you now, 
have rounded domes as well. While the Taj Mahal was built from marble, other buildings were predominantly covered in small pieces of tile instead. Marble was too expensive for most people to afford. You saw some of these tile-covered buildings when you walked through the city earlier, but your path eventually brought you to the gates of this most famous monument. Soon you will be able to shadow the chief architect, Ustad Ahmad Abdullah Lahori, as he oversees the finishing touches to this glorious creation. You stroll through the wide courtyard of the Taj Mahal, where the architect, Lahori, is assessing the area. A tall, bearded man, wearing a turban, he has a calm, contemplative expression, and he walks slowly as he looks at everything in detail. In the next few years, the architect plans to turn this space into a lush green garden with a pool dividing the courtyard in two. It will be filled with the clearest, bluest water, and it will be known as the reflecting pool. The edges of the pool will be lined with trees, creating a wall of greenery on either side. Not too far from you, Lahori is strolling across the part of the courtyard where the pool will be built. He's inspecting the different corners, checking to see if all is ready for the upcoming construction work. You follow Lahori through the courtyard, being sure to keep up with him while also going slow enough to appreciate your surroundings. The proposed design of the garden is inspired by the Islamic concept of paradise. It will be divided in two by four rivers which flow from a single stream. Although the garden hasn't been built yet, this place already feels heavenly, you think. The Taj Mahal is unmissable, even from a distance. But standing here, you see that everything has been constructed, so the main building is the prime focus. It's a breathtaking sight that holds your attention and doesn't let go. The white marble lit up by the first rays of the sun, is mesmerizing. The polished white-gray stone glistens everywhere. It's pristine and looks new, as if it's just been brought here. The marble for the building was supplied by a small town in Rajasthan in northern India. This town is known for having the finest marble in the world. Only the best would do for the emperor's beloved wife, after all. But the Taj Mahal isn't entirely marble. Some parts of it have a foundation of sandstone. Plates of marble reinforce these areas covering up the sandstone and creating a structure that is beautiful and sturdy. In the center of the building complex is a large rectangular base with a rounded top, known as the Central Onion Dome. The highest point of the building stands at more than 70 meters 
cutting an imposing figure on the landscape. Four tall minarets stand apart from the main building. When viewed from the garden, they give the effect of framing the onion dome structure, adding a sense of depth and grandeur. The minarets have rounded tops, resembling smaller versions of the central dome. The whole complex is strongly inspired by traditional Persian architecture. The central dome is smooth and shiny, with not one flaw to be seen in its construction. It seems impossible to believe that something this perfectly smooth could be carved out of rough, heavy stone. The garden you're walking through is covered with soft grass. Your feet sink into it as you take the slow steps towards this gorgeous monument. You find it's hard to take in all its beauty at once. The grandeur of the dome is dazzling, and you want to keep looking so it's embedded in your memory forever. You notice some steps on one side of the building. A few workers are sitting on them, having their morning coffee and maybe a bite to eat as they get ready for a day of work. Their job is to take care of the carvings, engravings, and calligraphy found within. The decorations of the Taj Mahal are what you're here to see. You want to fully understand just how much work has gone into making this extraordinary place. The chief architect, Lahori, stops at the gate of the primary structure and examines something by the door, which is unlike any other gateway you've seen. It's as grand as everything else in this building complex. There's a massive arch at the top, and the panelling is decorated with an intricate floral design. You see some Arabic calligraphy as well, but it's only half done at this point. Some of the workers you saw outside are probably the artists for this part, you think, marvelling at their craftsmanship. You take a closer look at the black lettering on the stone and see it's engraved ever so finely with flourishes and swooping letters. The Great Gate, which leads to the Taj Mahal, is famous for its main inscription. It reads, O soul, thou art rest. Return to the Lord at peace with him, and he at peace with you. This inscription was completed in 1609, so it's already been here for some time now. There are many lines from the Quran that adorn the monument, as it is, at its heart, a final resting place. Many of the inscriptions and decorations in the Taj Mahal include floral designs, abstract shapes, and free-form lines. In some areas, the marble is inlaid with black jasper, which is a member of the quartz family. The inscriptions higher in the walls are larger and arranged so that someone looking up from the ground can still read the lettering. 
Even the tiniest detail here is deliberate and carefully thought out. You follow Lahori as he moves towards the central chamber of the main structure. As you approach, you can hear artisans inside the empty room, working away on the delicate walls. Their chisels and hammers make soft tapping sounds that reverberate through the large space. Once in a while, a worker stops. The sounds fade as he blows off the stone dust and examines his work. Then, satisfied, he resumes, and the little tapping noises fill the air again. You walk through the chamber at a leisurely pace, influenced by the slow rhythm of their work. As you look around, you try to gauge the amount of effort that went into creating this place. The dome you saw from the garden is the ceiling of this room. The marble shines and glistens just as much on the inside as it did on the outside. Sunlight filters through the lace-patterned windows, and the space around you is lit up with a golden hue. You can see tiny dust particles floating around in these orange-yellow rays of light. They look like fine sugar drifting through a sieve. When the light hits the particles at the right angle, they shimmer like fairy dust. The windows are just as intricate as the carvings and inscriptions on the walls. They have been hewn from vast blocks of stone, but the latticed appearance makes it hard to believe. The windows are so fine and delicate, with thin interlacing strands of stone. The rays of sunlight illuminate the marble walls surrounding you, and the room glows with an ethereal hue. Very few people have been here at this point, so the building feels new and immaculate. It holds the special allure of a place that has only had a few visitors. There are still some ladders and platforms here and there, but most of the construction equipment has been cleared away. A worker is sweeping the floor with a handmade broom crafted out of bamboo. As he sweeps, the broom makes a swishing noise against the marble floor. You bring your attention back to the architect, Lahori. He is now inspecting something on a wall, which separates this area from the inner sanctum. You feel your curiosity rising as you walk towards him. As you get closer, you notice something different about the walls here. On either side of the door that leads into the inner chamber, there are small alcoves that have been cut into the stone. The alcoves are gently curved and slightly pointed at the top. You notice the architect carefully running his index finger across the edge of one. You can tell that he's checking the evenness of the carving to see whether it needs to be sanded or refined further. 
you're mesmerized by the sense of duty and care Lahori has towards the Taj Mahal. He has gone to such great lengths to ensure absolute perfection, and continues to do so even now. Once he is satisfied with the alcoves, he turns his attention to the painting on the wall around them. It's a multicolored network of gorgeous florals connected by vines and creepers. The vines are predominantly blue and yellow, with orange and green details in the corners, and shades of brown on some of the petals. The patterns intertwine in an elegant fashion. They're like a visual representation of lyrical Arabic poetry. You move a bit closer and inspect the minute details of the colorful patterns. This is when you have a surprising realization. These aren't paintings at all. The wall you are looking at is one of the best examples of an art form called Pietra Dura. For this technique, a base stone is inlaid with stones of different colors to create a beautifully contrasting visual that resembles a painting from afar. Examining the wall closely enables you to see where the colorful stones have been put in. This work must have required so much time and patience, you think. You imagine a devoted artisan with a furrowed brow, focusing on placing the stones just right, and then standing back to inspect his handiwork. Almost instinctively, you take a step back, trying to understand what the artisan must have seen. It's striking how these plants look like they were painted with a brush. They are still very new, so the colors are vibrant and bright. In some ways, they foreshadow the real plants that will soon flourish in the garden outside. As you look over to the other side of the wall, you see Lahori inspecting the work currently being done by a carver. A man in his sixties, carefully creating patterns on the wall. He taps away with his sharp chisel and tiny hammer, making designs that look like flowers and leaves. The wall is stony and rough, but through his work, something delicate and magical is emerging. The design is about halfway done at this point, and looks like it will become a lily or a daffodil. The architect watches closely as the slow, deliberate tapping of the chisel refines this magnificent stone. The embossed parts of the plant are slowly coming to life. You think about the contrast here between the soft plant and the hard, rough background of the stone. Beauty is truly in everything around you. It's just waiting to be revealed by an artist's hand, working steadily and gradually. When Lahori is satisfied with the work of the artist, he begins heading towards the interior 
This is where the tomb of the queen, Mumtaz Mahal, is located. She was buried here just a couple of years ago. This is a sacred, somber place. As you enter the room, you feel the sense of serenity and calm that pervades the air. The tomb is located in the middle of a circular room. Surrounding it is a boundary wall, which has the same lacy pattern you saw on the windows outside. It looks almost like a trellis, only denser, with smaller gaps. Walking closer, you notice that the gaps visible from afar are actually formed by interlinked floral carvings. The stalks and tiny leaves are spaced evenly. What a marvelous work of art, you think. The intricacy makes you wonder about the bond that must have existed between the emperor and his wife for him to create something this breathtaking in her honor. The tomb itself is the definition of beauty and grace. It's decorated with exquisite Arabic lettering. These are the 99 names of God as given in the Quran. Although you don't understand exactly what each one says, you find yourself staring at the black writing, transfixed by the looping, slanting script. Sunlight filters into the room, but it glows a slightly darker orange than the light in the other chamber. Perhaps it's because of the angle at which it enters, or just that it's later in the day at this point. It illuminates the intricate patterns that cover the floor. Before long, you see that Lahori is getting ready to leave. You follow as he walks through a corridor lined on one side by massive windows. These have the same lace pattern. As you walk through the corridor, your footsteps echo off the stone walls. Lahori is making his way to the back of the Taj Mahal. He'll be checking on the other buildings, which flank the main one and are currently under construction. You wonder if you should follow him. It's true, you're curious to see the mosque and the guest house that are being built. As you ponder, you reach the open platform at the back. Here, behind the main building of the Taj Mahal, you're offered a lovely view of the Yamuna River. You pause to take it all in, while Lahori continues on. There isn't much for him to do here, as this part has been completed. But you'd like to stay. The other buildings can wait for another time. Standing at the edge of the platform, you take a long, deep breath. It's a bit later in the day, and the air is still cool and fresh. The sun isn't too high in the sky yet, so it's only just beginning to warm up. It's a comforting kind of warmth that leaves you feeling content. 
you touch the marble boundary wall of the platform and run your fingers across the surface. It's remarkably smooth to the touch and cool against your skin. As you stroke the smooth marble, you consider how this place came to be. You think about all the people who gave so much of their time to make Shah Jahan's dream a reality. You gaze at the Yamuna River as these thoughts drift through your mind. The Taj Mahal is gorgeous in its own right, you think, but the sight and sound of the river adds another dimension to the experience of visiting this place. The water is pristine and clear, and the bank is wide. You see a couple of horses by the river's edge, drinking water before moving on. You think it could be easy to spend the next couple of hours right here, gazing at the river, letting your mind wander through all the wonderful sights you've seen. There will be more to do later, but for now, you're content. You know this day will last forever in your memory. It's as though the Taj Mahal is a part of you now. In your dreams tonight, there will be colorful vines and white marble and the fresh, clear sounds of the river in the background. You feel the love that is reflected in every carving and design. Like so many visitors in the past and future, you've been mesmerized by the grandeur of the Taj Mahal. You'll think about this place for days to come, grateful to be living in a world so full of beauty. <laughs>